Welcome back. The topic of this video is the QA of linear accelerators. And now some people say that this can be a bit dry, and I, I get that. We go into a lot of numbers, a lot of facts. So to spice it up a bit, I've brought along a little friend here to help me. Avi, how are you doing? Good. All right. So now, Avi, you've been following along in these uh, visi on these videos, right? What yeah. Do you, what do you think so far? Um, I think they're good. I also have a question. What's what? the QA of linear accelerators? You know, that's a great question. If you watch this video, which I haven't made yet, but if you watch it, you're going to find out. You excited? Yeah. Yeah, okay. He's trying to sound more convinced. Yeah! <laughs> All right, here we go. Sorry, I punched you. <laughs> <laughs> in going through this, I'm going to rely on these reports from the AAPM. This one is TG142, which you already saw in the last video, published in 09. Another one is the Medical Physics Practice Guideline. This one is 8A. These are reports that are kind of like TG reports, but meant to be more like practical in nature. And then here's uh, TG198, which is not out yet, but will be soon. So there's three reports. They're all slightly different about Linux QA, but these are the standards uh, right now. So here's a summary of these QA recommendations. I'm synergizing here data from these three reports, and I'm looking at a photon beam, and I'm looking at a machine that can do IMRT. And so any, anything going to deviate from this, the numbers might change a little bit from here. I'm going to march through each of these tests one after one so you'll understand them. But let's look first broadly. So you have dosimetry checks and one kind of uh, type of QA, and then you've got um, mechanical checks. And I'm not showing, by the way, every single check in these reports. I'm just trying to show the ones that are major ones that are most important. So you've got your frequency, you've got daily uh, monthly, and then checks that should be performed annually. One thing you'll notice here in the table is that there are fewer daily checks, right, than there are monthly checks. And that should make sense, given what we learned in the last video. And then also, you'll see here, like, the tolerances are different. So you get a tighter tolerance on the checks that are done annually versus monthly versus daily. And again, hopefully that makes sense. All right, so... Um, I want to point out a couple of discrepancies or differences here. So the ones in red, those are reports, those are tests that are only recommended by one report, MPPG 8A in this case. And then I've got bold here. The bold ones, those are things where the tolerances are different between the various reports. So you'll see largely the reports agree, but there are some slight differences. You don't need to maybe memorize that, but be aware of it. Okay, so let's start with these first two on the top. This is the important dosimetry test of looking at the machine output and the profile, and let's look at the annual first. So good thing is the annual I think you already understand. You'll remember this formalism from TG51 or TRS398. We talked about this in video 16.2. Remember that you use a farmer chamber, the large volume chamber. We talked about that chamber in video 16.1. And it has to be done in water. Remember that TG51 and says water tank. And we talked about water tanks in video 17.1. So I think this is hopefully just a lot of review. So that's kind of the annual for dosimetry. Uh, you also need to look at the beam profile annually. And so you can scan in a water tank, like shown here. That's a most common way to, to do this on an annual basis. It's kind of a difficult test to do. Um, now let's look at the monthly. So you'll see the tolerances are a little bit um, less strict there and you want to make it practical. So we don't do it in, in water, we do it in plastic here. So you're looking at an output constancy. That's much easier to do. So it's much easier to do these measurements in a kind of plastic rather than setting the tank up. Incidentally, the kind of material you're looking at here is called solid water or water equivalent plastic, and it's meant to mimic uh, water in terms of the composition. You also need to measure the profile on a monthly basis, and so here's a device that might help you do that. Each of these little checks is an ionization chamber in the device. You can measure profile. This is the matrix device from IBA. Uh, I, I can't mention all the devices out there. There are a lot of them, but here's, for example, another one from Standard Imaging, a QA check device, and again, sort of similar operation with ionization chambers. Um, here's one for stereotactic radiosurgery that uses a, an EPID 
like device with high lots of uh, pixels in it. All right, so now let's move to the daily QA. So because this is done so frequently, it's important to have uh, equipment and techniques that are gonna let you do this easily. So I'll show a couple of examples. So here's one device, uh, the beam checker from standard imaging. It sits under the beam uh, like this uh, and you uh, set it up to 100 SSD here. The way this works, there's a little chamber, ion chamber in the middle that measures the output in the middle. Then you've got other chambers on the sides here, offset 7.5 cm, and those allow you to measure the flatness and the symmetry. So you can do that daily. Uh, then in addition, uh, this particular device has some chambers here, and those are energy selectors, so they have different filtrations on them. And then you can also run this for electrons. You just, in this case, it, you flip it over and the other side is for electrons. And then, so with all devices like this, you typically you can trend them over time. So you can see here the output each taken each day. You can see the trends. So with devices like this, this daily QA has become pretty efficient. And so I think that's part of the reason you're seeing this difference here. The reason that the profile was not recommended as a daily measurement in TG142. It was written in 2009 and some of these things weren't available then, but are now. Okay, so let's move to the next um, measurement in the symmetry realm, and that is beam quality. So this is pretty simple. You're measuring a TMR at a depth of 20 divided by TMR at a depth of 10. And that ratio will tell you about the quality of the beam, the energy of the beam. You'll recall this type of a plot. Uh, we saw this back in video 10.1, and then you saw this many times in the problems if you work through them that uh, the PDD or TMR depends on the energy. So by measuring this ratio then you can see whether the energy has changed and that would be either a monthly or an annual. Okay, wedge output factor is easy. That's just um, the ratio with the wedge versus without. And then the next two, what you're doing here is looking at the output of the machine. So let's say number of centigrade per MU and it shouldn't change with dose rate or gantry angle. And there's the tolerance. All right, so now we're going to move on to the mechanical tests that are required for Linac QA. And the first series of these are basically related to how the gantry moves. And I'm going to um, run through these. I'll run through all the mechanical tests uh, relatively quickly show you. But remember that uh, these are C-arm gantries. We talked about these. You can go back and look at video 9.1 to review if you want. But this whole thing rotates around. And then, the, uh, you know, the couch can also rotate and then translate. So I can look at the left, right, the in, out, and also the up, down position of the couch. So that's the first of these tests to make sure that 10 centimeters equals 10 centimeters, let's say, on the couch. Then we want to look at gantry angles and collimator angles. So when I'm at uh, 90 degrees in the gantry, say, it really should be read 90. And the way you do that is just with simple devices like this, the level or they even have the fancy digital level that you can use. And that brings us to our next test, the radiation isocentricity. So let me explain that. So remember the gantry rotates around this way. Okay, so it's rotating around some axis and it go, rotates around some point in space, the isocenter. And let me draw the axis out here. This is the axis around which the gantry rotates. So it's kind of coming out of the picture. But there's other rotations as well. So the collimator up here in the head that rotates around as well. So that's around this um, axis here. I'm going to draw it in blue. Okay, and then also down here uh, at the bottom, the table rotates as well as the couch. So and that rotates around some axis here that I'll draw in red, uh, and it hopefully aligns. But this is part of the test. So so all these points are supposed to coincide here at some point, uh, the isocenter. So this is what this isocentricity test is, is that these three rotation axes should coincide with each other exactly, and then, then there's some tolerance on that. So according to the tables here, it's plus or minus one millimeter, or you could say three millimeter diameter sphere that they should all be within. 
and then that's tested annually. It's quite a tricky test to do very accurately. So uh, let's keep marching down our list here. We have crosshair centering. So here uh, you have the crosshairs, the little X in the white field, and as you rotate around, uh, the idea is that these should not wander. So a simple way to do this is to put graph tape paper on a table, and each of these small squares is one millimeter. And it shouldn't, you can see it doesn't wander very much here. Okay, next, light field radiation field coincidence. Let me explain that a bit with the figure. So uh, here's an actual diagram of a LINAC from one of the vendors, Electa. Let me, I'm just going to simplify this for the cartoon. So you have the source up here at the top, but then also in addition in Linux you have this thing, which is a, a light source. So it's a, sort of equivalent to that radiation source, but it's a light, optical light. And then there's a mirror in here, a thin mirror, a mylar mirror that the radiation beam can go through. The light reflects off this, and if it's aligned just right, then the divergence is such that that light source looks like the radiation source, essentially. But what happens if I move it? or something, then you can see the divergence would be like totally wrong in the source. And uh, you can also have like asymmetries and all kinds of things. So you need to test this, it's a very important test. So uh, here's one way to accomplish this. You can get this little jig, and what you do is line up the light field to the square. So you know where the light field is, and then it has these radiographic markers in it. These are little BBs, and those are visible, uh, and so you know where those are relative to the light field. So you take an image of this. Now you, from this image, you know where your radiation field is. You can just see where the edges are. And then you can also see the BBs on this image. If I change the window level here, you see the little BBs, and those tell you where the light field is. So you, you can kind of calculate the coincidence of the light field and the radiation field and see how close they are in millimeters. All right, so let's march on with our list here. Uh, next thing is wedge placement. So that's pretty easy. You can measure it physically or you can measure it dosimetrically. Field size, again, something you can measure just physically, either on a film or an epid image or even on graph paper. And then the graticule uh, is next. So graticule I haven't talked about, so let me spend a minute on this device. So uh, here's what it looks like in the beam. It's the little plastic tray that clips in there. And if I zoom in, here's what it looks like. And you'll see there are these metal rods in it. These are divergent with the beam, and they create a little shadow on the, um, on the image. So here's what it looks like on a film. And you can see the isocenter in the middle, and then each uh, line is at a millimeter of distance. And so you can see the alignment of the patient relative to isocenter. Okay, so we have to QA this thing. So here's one way to do it. You can put graph paper on the table, make a field, a square, and you can see the edges of that field, and then you film it, and then you see where the graticule is, so you can see how well the graticule aligns with the radiation isocenter of the machine. I think there are probably many vendor devices available that will help you measure this type of thing, but I'm more of a graph paper guy. Okay, so let's move on with our list. We're going to do the next two things, and that is lasers for alignment of the patient and the ODI, which is the optical distance indicator. So these are the last two things in our list, and they have to do with aligning the patient. So I kind of group them together at the end. Let's start with the lasers. So this is what the laser system looks like. I'm going to walk through this and try to explain it. So first of all, you have three modules in this picture. You have one on the left of the patient, one on the right, and one overhead. And those laser modules project like a line onto the patient. And here's what the unit uh, looks like. And actually it's projecting two lines, a vertical line and a horizontal line. Uh, these lasers also come in different colors. That can help with visualizing them in different skin colors. And so here's what this might look like on a patient. So this, you see the one laser from the wall on the right side projecting, and it makes like a little cross, and you can mark the point where the cross intersects at the laser point. So let me show how this works by using a cartoon. So let's look at a patient here. This is an axial slice, and here are the lasers. You get three of them. 
and they intersect the skin at these three points. If I could extend these lasers in, they would intersect at the isocenter here in the middle. You can't see that inside a patient, but you can QA that. And then we have marks in the patient, one there, one there, and one there. So that's on the skin, maybe it's a marker point or a tattoo. So here's what the patient looks like, and then there's the lasers. So they line up. Now when a patient comes in, maybe they're shifted, you can see here. So then I could align them, moving the couch table support to align it. But also this three-point setup is good because you can even get rotations. You see here it's rotated, so I can only get one of the points to line up, not all three, but if I rotate the patient, then I can get them to line up. It needs to rotate a little bit more. There you go, now I can line it up. And so this is the uh, advantage of this three-point setup. So you can see then how this would work in the room. The lasers all point at one point. So in order for this to work accurately, these lasers all have to align to the isocenter of the machine. That's the key, and so that's the goal of the QA. Uh, here I'm also showing the laser system in the simulator room. This is the CT simulator, and it's basically the same as the LINAC. Only difference is that in this uh, system, the lasers can move left, right, and up, down. So let's look at the QA system then for today's lasers. Uh, again, I'm gonna go with the simple system here. I'm just showing a piece of graph paper taped to the couch and a laser shining down from the top. And then you can check the alignment. And here you'll see in this case, they're really well aligned. They're within probably a half a millimeter. Each one of these lines is one millimeter. So this is the easy way to do it. Uh, you have to figure out a way to test the wall lasers too. Those point from the side. So different ways to do that as well. Here's a jig that can help with that. You align the laser pointing up down to the square, or the lines in the square, and then you rotate the whole thing, and then you can get the side laser pointing from the side. And there are different ways to do these tests, but on different devices that can help facilitate it. All right, so we come to the last stop on our trip, which is this ODI. So let me show you that in action here. You can read the ODI here. You'll see where, right where the crosshair is, the SSD here is you can read out through the numbers. So here I'm raising the couch, and as I raise the couch, you see the ODI reading decreases. So here it would be at, let's say, uh, a little less than 94 cm, source to surface. So let me show you a bit more how this works. You've got the central axis point, and you've got this light up here with a scale on it. So the scale projects numbers out into the room um, with light. And so the first number up here might be 80, and then uh, another number further down, let's say this might be 100. And then another number down even further might be 120 SSD. Okay, and then this is uh, then what it looks like on the actual patient. So to read the SSD, I look at the crosshair and see where it intersects the ODI reader, and that is the SSD. So now as I move up, I read one SSD, let's say 80 here. And then as the patient moves down, the intersection point will happen at different points on the reader, and so I'll get a different SSD. So there's one more QA test uh, that I left to the end here. That's the test of the MLC leaf positions. I put it at the end because it's, it's very important as you can imagine, for a machine that's delivering IMRT or VMAT especially, you need to know that the leaves are in the right position. I'm simplifying it here a bit on the table, just saying monthly test one millimeter, uh, but the details are a little bit more complex than that. But let me just show you a couple of the tests that can be run to assess MLC position. So here's one of these tests, the MLC uh, strip test or picket fence test. Each one of these strips is made by the bank of MLC leaves. So there's a thin gap, and then a move gap moves over the field. And you can analyze where the MLCs are in each one of these strips. Here's an analysis of this. So here you'll see the histogram of position of leaves relative to where they should be, and you'll see that they're all where they should be to well within a fraction of a millimeter. So this test passes. Here's another test. This is actually looking at the leaf speed as the uh, goes around, the gantry goes around. 
And so it's taken with film as it, that rotates with the gantry, and it's broken up into segment segments. Each segment has a different mu per minute and a different gantry speed, angle per second. So in each rectangular area, the leaf speed and gantry speed are different. And so what this test is showing here is that the uniformity and the dose output within each one of these rectangular regions is the same as the leaf speed and gantry speed change. So those are a few of the MLC tests that you run on a regular basis. All right, so there you go. This the QA of linear accelerators. There's a lot of facts, a lot of information, but you can go back and review it. I'm going to leave you with some of these references, some further reading to dig into it more if you need. And I, I hope this gives you a basic overview of, of at least the essentials of what needs to be done to ensure high quality treatment. Thank you.